Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, what are some common misunderstandings about autism? And I'm in conversation with Andrew Edwards. Hi, my name is Andrew Edwards. I'm 35 years of age. I'm from Wrexham in North East Wales. Uh, and uh, I'm a three time published author, including a well received 2015 memoir on my life with autism entitled I've Got a Stat for You My Life with Autism. Uh, hitherto to that, I used to work at Manchester United Television for 11 and a half years as a broadcast statistician. Uh, um, and, and I've also been invited to the House of Parliament and Buckingham Palace. Quite, uh, quite a CV there, you, you, and, and quite and a wide also, range of stuff as well. Thing, I've also been a guest on the Today programme. Oh, I'm wow. Sure. Tell me about that. What did you go on the Today programme to talk about? Well, about my life with autism, Pookie. I was, uh, it's, the interview is still available to listen to online five and a half years later. Uh, I was interviewed by John Humphreys. He was in his house in Raven's Court Park in West London. I was recording it, recording the interview in, in Glendale University in Wrexham. And there was another lady in between who was a new broadcasting house. And I was in, I was trying to find the publisher for my memoirs at the time. I'd written there was uh, the previous year I've been made redundant from Manchester United Television after the last half years. I think it was a good thing that happened really because it's it, it, it run its course, it was a wonderful time, but it run its course. And so I decided to write my memoirs. I got to do some popular publishers, Jessica King was the publishing turned me down, amongst others. And then I uh, got in touch with some media companies to see if anyone wanted me. I want to be on just to see, just to get some publicity to see if it would work. And I got, was contacted by the Today programme. And one thing led to another, and I was a guest on it on Easter Saturday 2015. Uh, and fortunately, my future publisher, Benny and Kearney, were listening, tracked me down because I had very little online presence at the time. I wasn't on social media. I, I'm still not on social media so in, 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 a, in a fashion. Uh, and uh, James sold them UTV, my public, was not my publisher. And the rest is history. I signed the deal uh, exactly the minute a year later I was made redundant from my United Television. Oh, wow. Wow. That's quite a, a milestone moment. Yeah. And why did you, you know, what inspired you to, to write your memoir and want to talk about it on, on today and, and things like that? What were you hoping to sort of achieve with that? Well, I always thought I'd, 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 I'd led an interesting life. Like I was. I had a very checkered schooling. I was allegedly tied up in one school for my staff with only child who could speak in the class. And in another, another, another school, I was allegedly, and I use that term very, very loosely, uh, allegedly assaulted by uh, a member of staff who has a close family member who's a high profile television personality in their family. And uh, it was just, and also, I'd overcome, not overcome, like I, man, I, I, I managed that in my life to achieve milestones to work at my study television. Uh, I, get, I, get, I, get, I, get, I was only supposed to be there one day and I was there 11 and a half years. And just certain aspects I thought I had an interesting story to tell. And I really wanted to, like I, like, I discovered, like, like I got, to break down perceptions regarding autism, the, the way that specialists diagnosed me to my mother in April 1989, and he said, go home and watch Rain Man, it is likely your son will be institutionalised. So that's how I was diagnosed at the age of four, and we were always determined to prove him wrong, to prove him wrong, so I, I think we've done that. So. Uh, I basically, I basically went to. I basically, I thought it was an interesting life, and I thought it was a story. To, it was a story to tell. I don't think it would have been a story to tell if I didn't have autism. So that was an advantage in one respect of writing the memoir, because autism was the selling point. Even at the time, people, or some, some of my mates thought Manchester United Television would have been more of a selling point because of Manchester United, I could be one of the biggest football clubs in the world. 
but very much the autism has been the selling point with the book. And I just wanted to like make, uh, get my feelings and emotions down to hopefully make a relatable and interesting story. And have people responded to your story in the way that you <clears throat> hoped that they would? Do you think it's helped people understand autism a bit more? Hopefully, yes. Uh, it's been very well received to my face. And I've had good, good testimonies from some well-known personalities, uh, quite a few well-known personalities. And I'd certainly say it's sold more than statistically you would expect, because statistically only 50% of books, published books, sell 200 or more copies. Mine sold 1,121 or 1,122, which grand scheme things, when you think of all the big sellers, it's not many, but it's, it's, it's actually a lot when you consider 50% of all published books sell 200 less copies in their lifetime, copies or units. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done pretty well. Most of the books that have sold have been on a face-to-face -face basis rather than online because I do give non-profit speeches in, not, well, in North Wales and North Wales and the Northwest of England. I don't tend to travel for that, but I don't really see it as a career that or so forth. Like some people who are autistic charge hundreds and hundreds of pounds going in everywhere. There was one who went to Palmerston North in New Zealand and I only time I heard of Paris and North was when England, England cricket lost the tour match there in the other day in 2013. But you just think, well, that's a bit much. And also with the non profit speeches, I do like to have variety with them. But I just wanted I, I, people, I think, to my face, have said to the name to it. So that's, that's good. And what do you think are some of the things that people don't understand about autism? Clearly, when you were originally diagnosed, then your mother was given a very different sort of outlook on your life than how things have turned out. So could you talk to us a little bit about that, about the things that you think people don't understand and what perceptions perhaps need to change? I think, I don't think people realise that autistic people can be empathetic. Oh, speak to myself. I can't always speak for others, but certainly if I, I am, I, I, I'd assume others are so empathetic, perceptive, self-aware, not particularly what I would term geeky, uh, and just certainly interested in sports and exercise and training and health. And I think that lots of people with autism would benefit from a healthy lifestyle if they could find the correct encouragement or the correct environment because I've heard a statistic that pardon the point this is a bit of paraphrase my memoirs was is uh, that I think the average age lifespan of someone who's so called high functioning on the spectrum is uh, sixteen years less than the average for the IT the average for the United Kingdom. And wow. that, uh, that I think is just Obviously, some of these high functioning people may have additional health problems, but the thing is, 16 years, blink and egg, that's, that's, a, that's a lot. 16 years less than the average. And I think there's a lot of people with, with disabilities, generally not just autism, who aren't encouraged to trade, who aren't encouraged to live healthy lifestyles. And like I say, being self aware, being able to speak my feelings and emotions, being able to see out certain way, ways people behave, pick, pick, on, pick on certain behaviours and be very sensitive to the surroundings that I'm in. So that's, that's a massive misunderstanding, I think, isn't it? That people assume that, yeah, if you're autistic, you, you don't feel somehow. There's that, 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 that real misunderstanding. And I think that this, um, what you're kind of touching on here as well about perhaps people having low aspirations, whether that's in regards of health and fitness or maybe what you might be able to achieve is potentially an issue as well, do you think? I don't have no aspiration. I don't think you actually think you have to generally say, well, you're going to be Prime Minister, or there has been someone autistic who has been Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. But the interesting part of, like, say, about high aspirations, 
one of the best footballers of all time is autistic, Lionel Messi, Robbie Williams, uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins, Marshall Mathers III, Eminem's autistic. And when I was growing up, you never tended to have it mentioned that people, people with autism could achieve. So you didn't have anyone you could particularly relate to, although it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to accomplish what those people have accomplished in their field. But it's just, it's, it's, it's a very much a smorgasbord, Pookie. It's very much, a, it's, a, it's not, it's called the spectrum condition for a reason. I think one that you've got to really have in life is achievable goals. Like even during the lockdown, which we're about to go into lockdown in about 55 minutes again. And you've got to have achievable goals in life. You've got to set achievable targets. Excuse me. You've got, you've got to have achievable goals. You can't just say, and if you have achievable goals from your beginning point, then your middle and end point would be would be more goals that you would be able to think that were achievable at the beginning. So it's about evolution, really. And how do you think that uh, we can support you know, if I were a, a teacher or a parent of an autistic child um, and we wanted to help them to, to kind of set and achieve, um, you know, achievable goals, as you say, what, what can help with that? What's helped you in the past? People speaking in a nice manner, people, a calm person, someone who's very calm, someone who's very clear, someone who's potentially a little bit concise in their instructions, but no ambiguity. I don't like ambiguity, to be honest. I can't hack that. Someone who's very clear in the communication and someone with no ambiguity, which I think those are big points of reference for me. Yeah. And are there things that make things particularly difficult? Are there things that people get wrong often that you think we should avoid? Sometimes, just being honest, I didn't know that much about my condition until after I wrote the book. Obviously, I knew the core traits, and I knew he was autistic. He was always going to be autistic. But I've learned quite a bit of peripheral traits since I wrote the book. Like, uh, even I dated a girl, and I'm sure she told me something very interesting, that very, this is very, very peripheral, that I probably got the toilet last minute because of my autism and my aim is quite bad for the toilet because of my autism. I never had an idea until then. And little things with what it was matters. Uh, a little bit with perception. I'm getting driving lessons, I've been getting driving lessons. And sometimes my perceptions are off when I'm driving in the lessons. And just what what's what's the other lesson I've been learned recently? Is uh, perception. Sensory issues, yeah, I knew about sensory issues in, in a fashion, but sort of like uh, clumsiness as well. Very occasionally I can be clumsy. And just that little things like processing information was always one. I never always realised that not processing information was part of my autism. I certainly do now. I'm being overloaded in such matters. So it sounds like you actually learned a lot about yourself whilst writing the memoir. It sounds like quite a journey. Uh, I think I knew that I experienced these traits and like these personality traits, but I couldn't put my finger on what was the autism and what wasn't. And that's always a very interesting point. When people say nature or nurture with someone, it's the same with my autism. What part is me as a person? What part is the autism? Like, like I didn't, like I, I, not, I just think that autism is a genetic condition. Well, I think I think it's pretty much, pretty much to be safely to be assumed that autism is a genetic condition. So, but I didn't realise what family member it was. But just before I was writing my memoirs, I realised which family member it was. So, it was a family member I didn't bother with. And the dye sense, but uh, mm. and it's something that's obviously become a really important kind of part of your life. You've written the book, and you go and you speak to people about it. Um, is it 
you know, is it one of the most important things about you, do you think? Or are there other things that you think? It's far more important matters than my autism, to be honest, Pookie. I'm not consumed by it. My family won't allow it, to be honest. <laughs> oh, you're talking enough about autism now, let's change the subject. I say certain matters, like what I find I'm more important with, you know, like cricket, training, music, comedy, gigs. I know obviously gigs are not permissible at the moment with the pandemic, but socialising with my mates, although I don't drink because of the medication I'm on with my autism. But I like to, oh, that's another thing I like to break down, that autistic people can be very, very, very sociable and have mates that aren't actually on the spectrum. That's something I like to break down. You can have mates of all kinds, all kinds of walks of life, personalities, where people who are autistic, stereotypically or typically, I don't know which, tend to have people that are autistic themselves or not, no mates at all. It's very much not like that with me. I've had mates who've been well known television presenters. I've had mates, well, I've mate as a former professional footballer. I've had all kinds of mates, a mate who's a solicitor. Uh, and all kinds, I could list them all, but that'd be just very boring. But like I say with the autism, it's not the most important part of me. It's an explanation for certain events and occurrences that happen in my life. But no, it's not every part of me. Like some people with autism, it consumes them. Because that's all they talk about day in, day out. And so, oh, and you got more than that. And I just think I like to have a variety of interests. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But that having that understanding of autism and understanding of self maybe means that you're more able to uh, engage with all those other interests. Because exactly, yes, exactly. That's a very, good, very, very, very well put, Pookie. Because I'm not particularly one for the science of autism because I'm not qualified to go down that route. But I, bet I my, me and my family have always been very much into the practicalities of such matters. This is an issue. How are we going to manage it sort, sort of in sort of matter? And that's what we're into. We're not into practicalities, we're not into the science of it because we're not qualified to assess science, the science of autonomous. Well I know of at least one speaker who charges quite a lot. It's quite a lot he's from not that least about twenty five minutes from Wrexham. He's he, they ch they charge top dollars just going about the science and I'm like oh, oh, no no not, not not one of our sides because you're qualified to do it mate. So. And it it sounds like you yeah you that that you're all about overcoming stuff and actually managing, not saying managing managing yeah because very seldom in life you never overcome anything if okay. you don't manage it if you success if you're lucky not if you're fortunate. And if you're successful, but you never overcome some a matter, you never overcome. You learn to manage, manage. And it sounds like you've got quite a good support network in terms of yes. uh, friends and and, and family. Yes. Um, when faced with you know obstacles or, or yes. challenges, yes. how what does that kind of look like? If you, could you maybe talk us through a time when there was something that you you wanted to do or that was you know more challenging, um, and you've had to to manage that and you've had some help with it. Well, when I was being redundant from Manchester United Television, my sister, who lives next door to me and, my, me and our mother, uh, decided to become my carer because all the support from the NHS had been cut. So I'd have been left with nothing, doing away at home all day, doing nothing. Uh, so she said, I'm not going to let that happen to Andrew. I'm going to take him places, drive him here till a certain time, go places with him, carry on his to carry on his gym training uh, and, and we're going to write that book Andrew we're going to write that book and I'm going to, I'm going to get, help you get the feelings out with that but my mum was very good she kept the papers for meetings and so forth and also I wrote two other books Pookie I wrote one in a local football and cricket club in, in Exxon and I wrote another one uh, called A Vision of Exercise about men, about which, which featured contributions from many different aspects of sport and exercise, including from elite level, elite level athletes, current and former, to 
just regular people who, 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 who find training as a release for their mental health or health generally. So That sounds really interesting. What inspired you to write that? Well, exercise has always been helped to me, but what I didn't realise was exercise actually had been helped to me at that point. It's how it's changed code, changed, changed gyms to a gym called the Moor HSP in, 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 in Queen's Ferry. So I, I realised I didn't enjoy training at that point. When I sat at the book, I realised I didn't enjoy training, but by the end of it, I realised I enjoyed it because I changed coach, changed trainers, book coaches, it was a co more qualified the one I went to in, in Queen's Ferry. I realised they made, they, they enabled me to enjoy it and I've still got that gym now. I've got a different coach because the other one moved careers, but it's very much number one, saved me in the summer of 2017. My mental health was playing quite bad. It wasn't probably lucky back, it was the worst episode of mental health issues in my life. But it wasn't good either way. So the gym helped. The gym helped me enormously. It gave me a reason to get up every morning, and it does. Obviously, it's going to be closer in two weeks, but but it's also given me the tools to train at home. And that's another thing. My sister was very good during the lock, first lockdown, when she actually turned her garage into a gym, into a very very good gym, so we could train at home before we went back to the gym. And my coach Hebo, who replaced Garrett, who was a who was a lovely lad, good coach, fantastic coach, but Hebo was a fantastic coach too. He programmed all my sessions on an app, so I take down all the all the repetitions, take down the the weight. So unfortunately, we had a lot of weight weight at home, so at home that Mel Melanie had, so so I could continue to train. So training means a lot to me. Right? Strength and conditioning and running. So, I'm playing cricket. So, so yeah, so sport and, and, and exercise then has been really important for you and, and, and for your mental health. Why do you think it's helpful? What, what about it? Is it a, a release or is it a, a, that, that kind of routine or connecting with people? Do you, do you able to put your finger on it? I tend to say with just me and my coach because I've, over time, met up my mates in different environments like recently I met up with a group in the cricket, a church cricket club. But in the past I met up with, I met a lot of my mates at Kevin Drews, met a lot of my mates at Manchester United Television. But the, but it's very much a release to training, mentally and physically. And it helps me compartmentalise the whole of my life, Pookie. It's like gym, afternoon, etc etc et and it helps you compartmentalise the rest of my life. Like I'm looking at starting a new job, paid position that in, in the new year. Uh, somewhere I volunteered at for many years, uh, from more heritage trust. And just use this as an example. If I'm at the gym in the morning, they they always said you look at the gym first, they come to us. So it'll be that. that so it's compartmentalised from different clothes to different situations, different different clothes in different situations, different mindset for different situations. And it's helped me enable me to get different mindsets and different, different just different setups in whatever I do. And you said that the um, the gym helped you when you had that difficult patch with your mental health as well. Is that something that you're happy to talk a little bit more about? Yes, because I had a few episodes of mental health in my life. I had mental health, mental health in my life. I had, a couple when I was at Manchester United Television. I did, looking back now, I probably had one after when I was allegedly beaten, allegedly assaulted by a member of staff when I was 11 at a school that I went to. That was probably, looking back now, that was bad mental health. But that was probably more PTSD, as they call it. But when you're 11, 12, you, don't, you just know you're happy. You don't really know about mental health. And then I had a bad mental health spell. I had panic attacks in the years leading up to it at Manchester United Television. But I had a really bad mental health spell at Manchester United Television around about 2011, 2012, 2013, and early 2014. Well, probably 2012, 2013, 2014 were the worst. And probably a little bit in the summer of 2017. But I'd say the 2017 one was probably milder than the type one at Manchester United Television back. Back, back in between 2012 and 2014. <clears throat> and the, the gym helped you 
through some of those? Uh, partly in 2012, <clears throat> partly in 2012 to 2014, but it wouldn't have probably that much in that era because the environment I was I was in training it wasn't very good, okay. it wasn't very good at all. Looking back, when in 2017 I changed the environment to a much more community-based environment with a non-profit gym that encompassed even elite level athletes in the area. So people who just take their training seriously and a very nice nice bunch as well as as well as uh just coaches were very very, very qualified there and uh, there's a better environment I, I, but i do think that everyone they've got to find their own environment their own correct environment for them and, and, and it could take years it took me probably about 13 years to find the correct environment Wow. And and what about it is it that's right for you now? Because you sound so happy when you talk about it now. It sounds like it's such a positive force in your life. Yes, yes, it is. And not only is it positive in my life, it's positive in my sister's life, Melody. She's very positive for her. But we don't always train together apart from on a Wednesday in the gym. But the next couple of weeks, the next couple of weeks, I'll be training at her gym after she's finished next door, and that, and then we'll go on separate runs. But on, usually a week to week outside of lockdowns, even circuit breakers, whatever, we train together on Wednesday. She even tra usually trains after me on a Monday or a Tuesday, and she trains on her own in, on her own in her own gym now with programs set up by a, a strength and conditioning coach, Chris Ever. So. It's a it's a big force, a positive in our family generally. So yeah. that's really good to hear. And it sounds like your sister is a really important person and influence in your life as well. And so is my mum. She's in the next room now, so I'm sure and I'm, I'm sure she will want to be praised. So <laughs> mum's very much mum had to fight. I mean, I don't know how mum had the emotional strength when I was growing up to fight everything, fight everything with that when I was like you beat up. It was like all these people against her, all these professionals against her, against this lady who was probably thought she was a nuisance, just protecting her autistic son. It was, it was immensely difficult for me when, when I was growing up. And then after that, I had meltdowns. I was really affected by it. And she was a power strength. She, she's one of the most emotionally strong people I've ever come across. <clears throat> And she had a very bad accident six and a half years ago, just after I left Manchester United Television. And people who aren't as emotionally strong as her would never have come back from but she she does everything in her power just to live a life that's quite good for her age. She's 78 she is in February, February 2nd. But she's one of the most emotionally strong people I've ever come across probably the most emotionally strong person I've ever come across. Because without her, when I was growing up, I don't know what would have become of me. And I don't know what would have become of me more in recent years than Melanie. But with mum certainly, when I was growing up, Melanie would not have been able to help with that because mum put all the foundations in place to enable me to have mates, to enable me to have the job I had, the future job I wanted to have. But like I said, there's one thing I really... If I could, one thing in the future I would like to, well, two things, two items I'd like to do in the future. One is to pass my practical driving test, and one is to have a long term relationship with a girl. So, yeah. Those both things. sound like really good, and they they sound achievable aims, hard work. Oh, but I think the driving is more achievable than that, but it's going to take time. The actual dating, I've I could tell you some stories, Pookie, about some of the some of the situations that I've come across on online dating. Oh, some ten, some situations you never thought human humankind would actually stoop so low. It's I've really? met some nice people, but there's some some people, some really odd odd people as well. It's just I've been stood up four times. Been right. taken, just, just, when it took two trains to get to Liverpool and the girl stood me up despite reading all my messages when I was giving an update to where I was. 
but the other one, when I say the name spelt differently, stood me up in Wrexham, which is from Wrexham, so it didn't matter so much, and irritating though it was. And another girl stood me up twice. And another girl with the same name but spelled differently again to the other two girls. She she's lied about her age by ten years. Fortunately, I found this out a day before we went on a date. So dodged that. And another girl I went on two dates with, had my first kiss with her. She was very much she broke up with me. Then she got a best mate involved, so, who she worked with, saying, "Oh, the per- so and so's not very, not very, not not very good today. She's devastated." Well, and then she was, then, then she was going to, then she was going to, then she went and touched me on the on WhatsApp and text. I blocked her on that. Oh, then I see she was back on the dating site. But fair enough. Then the next morning, I was going to a football match <coughs> in the Welsh Premier League to watch one of my work. Was one of my best mates manage and I got this big long marriage proposal offer saying can I meet up with you I want to propose to you I'm like whoa so I screenshot it and just thought not gonna happen I thought whoa it's just really strange character I have had some good good experiences there was a lovely girl I went out with went out with for three months we dated for three months but it petered out but I learned a lot from that, and it was a very positive experience. I got nothing but positive experiences from the last part of it. But with the lockdown, not with this one, but generally the coronavirus pandemic, it's it's not it's probably about the worst time you could possibly think of for going on dates and starting a relationship in well, probably even worse than World War Two, Boogie. <laughs> I think yeah it's 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 a tough time one of my best friends is also uh dating using online dating at the moment and and he said similarly that it's yeah it's especially challenging it's uh, not going to happen in this year especially if you come from Rex and Pookie you have from London because I signed up for an autism dating website and there it seems like people either from America or from the southeast of your neck of the woods in London and, oh. when you're from, and when you're from Rex and there's not even many from Manchester or Liverpool it's like and do you specifically use an so is it's an autism dating site specifically? You want to meet someone else who's autistic? Not necessarily, no, not necessarily. But I'm I'm open to that. I've been on dates with girls who are autistic. I've met on met on traditional dating sites. Yeah, I don't mind either way as long as it's someone that I'm compatible with, someone I get on with, someone that likes me for who I am, who I am, and I like them for who they are. It's I'm open-minded regarding that, but I think I've got to be honest with myself. And if I go to go, they'll probably have to have some sort of some sort of condition of some sort, either OCD, some sort of physical disability, or or, or something, something probably rather than someone who's got. Nothing, just not, not nothing, but they've not got anything particularly, particularly any conditions because I think, but then it's not just autism, it's like OCD and other things, dyspraxia. So I think she's got us dyspraxia. I've actually been on a date with a girl who's dyspraxic, there's a dyspraxic comedian. That wasn't too bad, but there's no spark. But, uh, but what makes you say that you feel that you would? need to go out with a girl who had some condition or disability? I think I, I've tried the other way. And I've actually been on dates with girls. I only started dating in October 2018. I was almost 34 then, Pookie. I was actually approached to go on, out the blue, to approach to go on a high-profile dating series on television. I was still by then for six weeks. We were at North East Wales in the summer of 2018. And that fell through at the end because they were a bit mean to me, to put it mildly. They were just thought I wasn't autistic enough. So they wanted me to crack, basically. So, but it made me think, I didn't want to, look, I wasn't looking for dating at that point. I was looking for trying to lift my profile. But it was very much a case of, after that, and I was like, yeah, I think I could go on a date. 
I could go somewhere and date a girl, but I've had very mixed, mixed, to put it mildly, mixed, mixed experiences. I think certainly with online dating, ostensibly it tends to be, you've got all this choice, but there's a lot of odd people as well. It's very, it's very, oh, oh. <laughs> also, but also you've got to also lots of people that want to be in open relationships like Brad Pitt's new girlfriend <laughs> but basically it's 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 jungle out there it's like it's, it's not what you want in life because I find that people are unwilling to give people a chance in, like there would be day-to-day -day life or like talking we are now although this is very much a working working conversation but you're willing to give people that opportunity to speak and express themselves where on my dating people you could be talking to people very cordially very friendly one minute but next minute next second literally they blocked you for no part of reason and it's like i know it's something within them but it's like well what do i do do i smell sure i've got a deodorant today <laughs> but it's like but it's like it's hard well, ideally with me, I would. I was late to it. I was thirty-three, but I certainly think outside of COVID, it would be more beneficial to meet someone in an organisation, meet someone at a club, sports club, or a shared interest club, yeah. or work. But they don't. That doesn't tend to happen anymore because with shared interest clubs, with someone like myself. Like we've discussed the way I express myself, people with autism who might be more high functioning don't tend to navigate to those places where people with learning difficulties tend to, which is no disrespect to those particular people. But it's like obviously, I, obviously, there's people out there who are autistic. I, I, I'm open minded about, but I do think realistically that someone with some form of aut I don't think there's that many. Oh, there's, it's very, 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 very quiet, that dating site that's for autism. Mm. It's, it's very, 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 very quiet. It's, it's not going to happen on there. Mm. But, and it's not going to happen because of COVID for the, probably until next summer at the very earliest, very, very earliest. But probably realistically, if I was honest, there are more girls who are probably either slightly who are, who are higher up on this on the spectrum or certainly got a certain traits of OCD, autism, dyspraxia, yeah. but are still very intelligent, very articulate, have a smorgasbord of interests, but and could relate to people. There are people like that that exist. The last girl I dated for three months was proof of that she had obsessive compulsive disorder. And we had a lot of shared interest, especially the Simpsons and so forth. So it's, it, girls like that do exist. And they probably do exist on traditional dating sites, but they won't probably exist on disability or autistic dating sites, what would say. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, yeah, I suppose it's a, uh, it's it's about finding that you only need to find one right person. I, guess. I know I, I, that that's a very positive way to look, Pookie. That's very positive. But the thing is, the thing is with with the dating sites, there's a lot of having to siphon stuff out beforehand. And what I found before was, you, I spent most of my life on there. Yeah. Oh, someone getting back into me. Someone getting back to me. And that's one thing with the lockdown of the coronavirus pandemic I've actually enjoyed, where it's not really a case of looking at my phone all the time, yeah, being on contact with people, being email, being WhatsApp, being text, but it can be very intense, those dating sites, and that's, I want, ideally, I want to avoid them, but I'm running a little low on ideas. <laughs> well, you you said that you're um maybe looking at um getting a a, a new or different job at, at some point. Um, uh, yes, this has been a long time coming, Pookie. 
Okay. It's very much, they're very, 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 very accommodating. It's because it's going to be lossy funded. It's going to be lossy funded. It's for the heritage cost in Maxim. Yeah. Uh, because I can't work more than 60 hours due to certain matters. But uh, in a week, but they're going to accommodate, they accommodate my gym. I went to have a trial there last year. Yeah. But just to get a taste of the environment. But uh, it's going to be, and I've volunteered there for quite, for quite some time off and on. I wrote a part of the book I wrote the local football and cricket club was to do with my volunteering there. Uh, it's something that they were, they were just waiting, well, hoping for lottery funding, for millions and millions and millions of lottery funding. I don't cost millions and millions, but, uh, <laughs> but very much to like, build a, a big, enormous heritage attraction yeah. in the area in Brumbo on the old steelworks, uh, very much. And it's got, and they're open to open sometime, probably about 2023, 2024. Okay. But it's very much, it's going to be, it's, it's all tens of millions of public funding behind it, lottery and other matters. And um, it's been a long time coming. I haven't been in a paid position since my United Television. But apart from the events of my memoirs, which is, but that wasn't that much. I was declared, but basically with with the job, it's, I'm really looking forward to it, and it's used to be getting closer and closer and closer. Yeah. And I know it's going to be a very accommodating environment where all the necessary adjustments have been made or will be made. So and I, and I just, sorry, sorry. And I, and I, everything will be. I know everything will be very calmly and clearly explained to me by my manager, the mate. Yeah, I was going to ask about what kind of accommodations help you um, in the workplace. Obviously, you um, held your your role at Manchester United for a very long time, so clearly that worked well for you, or I assume so. Yeah, I'm a different person to that now. To be okay. I'm more, I'm more. I'm just able to deal with certain matters better and more mature. I always went with my support worker, who's my bro my support worker at the time, who's also my brother-in-law. But a brumbo, I'm going to be on my own. But then I don't need any help be in that way because I know what's expected of me. I'm a different person. I'm more mature. And then my sisters enabled my sisters work with me, has enabled me to deal and manage with such occurrences and I know we got with we, my boss at Brumbo that he'll, he'll explain everything clearly concisely and calmly in a manner that I understand and I will get the message if I've committed yeah rock, committed a full part or something wrong and I know it and I just know it's going to work because it's just going to it's, it's, it's I'm a different person than MUTV and MUTV it was very much not just me, but the people up here in there. It was, uh, it was a very relaxed environment, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. And just going kind of completely back, I, I'm interested to know a little bit more about um, your childhood because <laughs> you talked about your mum having to um, kind of fight a lot of battles and the emotional strength that that took. And also about how that specialist right at the beginning said, you know, go home and watch Rain Man, your son will be institutionalized. And I'm just really interested to know really, what was it that your mum did? What was she fighting for in order to mean that that future was incorrectly predicted? And obviously you've, you've completely- Basically everything, basically everything you can think of, Pookie. One famous story was after I was allegedly beaten up, or well, allegedly assaulted in the, by the member of staff in that school when I was 11, which is outside the county of Wrexham. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say that because there's 10 counties and there's 45 minutes drive for Wrexham. Mm -hmm. But basically, but basically, she broke into the head of Wrexham Education's office afterwards, and she remembered, and the thing was, she wanted to see the head of education at the time. This is early 1998. I was going to St. Christopher's then. She wanted to she wanted to get a support worker for me. And she wanted to, it was my brother-in-law. It was my brother-in-law. And she also wanted to 
get the support that he required to go, go to St Christopher's School and next to special school. And basically, he goes, oh, he's not in today. I don't know if I've been here. I'll wait. And one of the staff goes, is so and so in? Yeah, just go ahead, go ahead. So she memorised the buttons that they pressed for the code, memorised it, went through, went to the his office and said, give my, son, give my son what he deserves. And yeah, yeah, I'll do it, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's what she did. And basically that's what got me there. So, yeah. So you've had your mum in your corner fighting for yes, you. Yes, all the time. Yes. And why do you think that she didn't accept the, you know, that initial uh, sort of speculation from that specialist that, you know, you wouldn't achieve? Because she clearly thought you could and you have. Yes. Well, I I don't know. I, 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 I think she just thought I would walk, I would talk, I would achieve what my siblings have achieved. I'll do what they've done. In a different way because we all achieve differently but basically she thought that i would i would basically i, I, would, I would do i would achieve and she wasn't going to she wasn't going to lay down without a fight everything she's done she's she's done she's fought to the point where she gets a bit exhausted now and she's almost 70 years yeah. yeah yeah and presumably it's meant that you've worked hard as well because these are not easy things to achieve are they you know I'm not particularly academically well qualified because of what happened at the, the, at the, at the surgeon schools, but very much, I'm very knowledgeable, very, very knowledgeable, I would say. I know a little bit a lot, but I'm not academically qualified. So, because of a disrupted schooling, because by the time we got to college age, I'd had enough by then, Pookie. I wanted to work at my Jason in television. Unfortunately, my mentor at the time there was very, very good. So, yeah, you yeah. let me go in through the back door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but you said you went for a day and you left 11 and a half years later, so I'm assuming yeah. that it uh, <laughs> you, you, you got on well there. Yeah, sorry, just to the phone. Sorry, Susan. Just there's just a bit of bits on the floor to pick that up after I come off to you, but basically, yeah, I. I I just did what I could do. I was just me. Uh, I was very quiet at first because my mum said you don't, you don't, you don't talk too much in the office. You don't talk. But I soon realised that MUTV was a very sociable office, to put it mildly, very relaxed. Yeah. Very. I don't know how to put this as well, but basically, very, very laid back to put it mildly and that's just the diplomatic way of putting it borderline some would say they always got the job done it was very much a creative industry i put it that way yeah and towards the end there was very much the clash of the creative industry against the corporate monster and unfortunately there's only going to be one person one more, more, more environment that's going to be that and it was the corporate monster but when it was the creative industry there no, they couldn't always put what they wanted to be in a club, club, club media, club channel. But it was very much a creative, media, creative environment where it was very different. And the thing is, people say, "Oh, don't always." People don't always realise. Well, Manchester United and Manchester United Television. Most time I was there, not now. But when I was there, a very different environment with def, very different ethos from both sides. MUT was very creative environment where Manchester United Television. Well, Manchester United FC rather was a very corporate environment where they never got the way we worked and we were, didn't like the way they worked. Really. Not didn't like, but we didn't really get the way they the way they worked. It was like a clash of cultures, I would say, to put it mildly. Yeah. And there's only one that was going to win, and it wasn't the creative industry that was going to win. <laughs> yeah, which is 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 a shame. Although it sounds that like you've got, you know you've got a, a bright. You know, you've got bright things ahead, and and, and yes, you know. but I, I, I certainly think we're bravo. It's going to be. I'm going to have to do my work, but I know I've got a fair idea of the environment. The people there are pretty good, well, pretty similar to last year when I retired. They're, they're looking expanding over the time because they've received quite a lot of lottery money. About a, a week before COVID properly struck the first lockdown, they got tens, they got the last bit of tens of millions of lottery funding and public funding so future is very bright there and I'm very fortunate to say that in this current climate 
yeah. what, what we're going to do with my job after thermal ends next week and, and the other scheme starts and so forth. I don't always like to mention this very much, but my future in that respect is I'll be doing what I want to do to put it now at this particular juncture of my life. And I think that's, that's great. I would want to do the travelling to my to Manchester all the time now. At before COVID, Manchester was very much a social environment for me going to gigs, meeting up with mates. And once COVID is more into more manageable portions, that's certainly what I want it to remain. Where I saw my work, I want to work more local, locally to home, which gives me the more flexibility for my gym work, for my gym, for working working out in the gym. So. And will you continue to write? Do you have plans for a further no, book? No, 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 I don't. Think. I've, got, I've, I've written three. I think I've made my, my contribution to literature. But uh, I did have an idea that I put my off to a publisher, but that was just before last Christmas. I wasn't bothered either way if it got accepted or not about dating, autism and dating, but I wasn't bothered either way if it got accepted. But I've moved on from that now, but it's very much... A part of my life that I'm extremely proud of. I'm extremely proud of it. And it's certainly a proud part of me that can never be taken away. And it's very unlikely if you've Googled me, which I hope you've Googled me for your research for this interview, mm -hmm. that it's something that's always at some point or other going to always appear on Google. So yeah i think that's, that's and that's a brilliant thing and also it's yeah as you say it's something that that can't be taken away that's always there but also um it, it's something that will influence how other people think and feel um and being able to share your experience in that way i think is such a powerful thing to do what um i i always like to to kind of finish with a closing thought so um you know what thought would you like to to leave people with when, 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 what do you mean? When, when, when I leave, when I die? When no, I'm now, at the end of the, at the end of the podcast, when people are listening. What thought? Just that, prove perception wrong, prove, I, I can prove perception wrong, and we all achieve what we want to achieve. And I just don't think, with all, there's no one size fits all in life, but with anything. And as guy like my old coach used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So, um, I always think that's a very pertinent term. But I also think that, just I think that, I just like to be. I'm proud of the person I am. I haven't always been happy with me. Probably about seven, eight years ago, I wasn't particularly happy with me. But now I'm very comfortable with my own skin, and I like myself. Which, if you don't like yourself, no one else is going to like you. Are you? Are they? So, so. And what is there any message that you think it would be helpful to give um, if a parent found themselves, you know, in a similar situation to your mum did all those years ago, where they've just received a diagnosis and they're not sure what the future might hold? There's a fight, fight, fight for everything, every little ounce of support that you get. So that's what you do. You got to fight, fight for everything. Nothing comes out of place. And I don't think the best thing to do in life is just have a sense of humour. I have quite a black sense of humour, because the British black sense of humour, because at the end of the day, if you don't laugh at something many years later, you continue to moan and groan and, oh, aren't I badly done to? Oh, and, and more is me. You won't achieve in life, you'll just be wallowing yourself. Because, yeah, we've all done that. We always, all, we all will do that at some certain junctures of our life. But there's a time where you've got to learn, or you've got to hopefully got to get past that and learn to manage your emotions and learn to make steps to adjust to your surroundings and adjust to what you need to do.